word expressed by Almighty God. It's the return Lord Jesus' word. The appearance of God has brought a new age. Did you not desire greatly to see the God in heaven? Did you not desire greatly to understand the God in heaven? Did you not desire greatly to see the destination of mankind? He will tell you all these secrets that no one can ever tell you. And he will even tell you of the truths that you do not understand. He is your gate into the kingdom and your guide into the new age. Lord, I have always looked forward to the time of your return. And now, have you truly come back? Can it actually be? Is your return almighty God? Pastor Lee, Preacher Jew, your church must get the news. The Church of Almighty God has published many pieces of Almighty God's Word in several large newspapers here in South Korea. They testify the Lord Jesus has returned to flesh and, what's more, has expressed millions of words. It's astonishing. What do you think of it? I've read these words of Almighty God in Korea Chungyong Daily. The words are indeed profound. They seem to come from God. They are words no man can have spoken. The word of Almighty God is very deep, it's true. But how is it proved that Almighty God is the returned Jesus? It says, in the Bible the Lord will come with clouds and every eye shall see him. But we've not witnessed this. It's a question, and I've thought on that. But the Bible does talk of another way in which the Lord will return. For example, Revelation 16, 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Come as a thief means coming in secret. But if when Jesus returns, he comes on a cloud and before the eyes of everyone, how will that fulfill coming as a thief? There isn't contradiction in the Lord's words. All of them shall come true just as written, his prophecies. The Bible prophesies two different ways, two possible ways that the Lord shall return. One is to come in secret, the other publicly appear. In that case, these two prophecies don't contradict at all. One is coming in secret and the other is to appear in public? It's likely, though, many prophecies from the Bible say the Lord will arrive as the Son of Man, as in the book of Luke, chapter 17, 24 and 25. For as the lightning that lightens out of the one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And because it mentions the words, the Son of Man, and suffer many things, then it must be referring to the incarnate flesh of God. Like when the Lord Jesus came, people treated him like an ordinary person, completely failing to comprehend that he was the Messiah, Christ. Uh -huh. And it is truly because God is incarnated as the Son of Man, to be unrecognized by the people as such. Hmm. Thus, it can be that his incarnation becomes a secret thing. Then, it is in accordance with the prophecy of his coming as a thief. And I think the prophecy of the Son of Man's coming probably refers to the coming of God in secret through incarnation. Ah. Makes sense, yeah. 
Now I'm thinking that it's very possible Jesus will come in secret as the Son of Man, then openly appear to the public. This has been acknowledged by many expositors. Then it's your understanding the Lord's return will be secret at first and will only become public later. What work will the Lord do between the time of His return and His public appearance? Several prophecies say that upon His return, He shall do the work of judgment, like these ones. For He comes to judge the earth. He comes to judge the earth, and I will come near to you to judgment. Also, He that overcomes is mentioned often in Revelation. For example, Revelation 2.7 says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. And Revelation 2.17 says, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and so on. In my opinion, these verses are telling me during God's time of his secret incarnation, he will make a group of overcomers by the judgment work. Is there other? Biblical basis for that? The Lord Jesus once prophesied, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Here, it says the Spirit of truth will guide us into all truth. I wonder if this means... God will become flesh in the last days to express the truth, to do the work of judgment. Right, and the Bible also says, and also on the servants and on the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Here it is written, God will pour out his spirit on the handmaids and servants, which must refer to the work of judgment beginning with the house of God. By this, God will make a group of overcomers first. And I assume the verses handmaids and servants refer to the first fruits made by God. They're those who serve God in the kingdom in the future. It's far more likely. So it seems for us to accept God's work when He comes in secret is quite meaningful. I remember, it also says in Revelation, For the Lamb which is in the middle of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them to living fountains of waters. When it refers to the Lamb shall feed them, this shows us God will be incarnated as the Son of Man to feed man. In other words, God will himself become flesh, the Son of Man, into the human world, giving man his living water of life, making a group of overcomers. Oh yes, I think so. Which means, in the time God incarnate is remaining hidden, God will make a group of overcomers by expressing the truth. We must grab this chance to accept God's salvation, or else... When God finally does appear in public, it'll be too late for regrets. Hmm. Suppose the Lord does come secretly through incarnation. If it's true, then how are we to recognize him? Then is Almighty God truly the Lord Jesus returned? I just remembered this. When the disciples asked about how to welcome his return, Jesus said, With vital importance, be as wise virgins are. For wise virgins are careful in listening to the voice of God. And when they heard the news God has come, they recognized the voice of God, and they went out and welcomed him. Today, we also have to pay attention to God's voice. As to whether Almighty God is Lord Jesus returned, we should seek it with great care and become more familiar with the word expressed by Almighty God. 
since the Church of Almighty God testifies, the Lord Jesus has come back and expressed words we should pray, seek, and discern it seriously. We shouldn't deny or condemn it blindly. We must read Almighty God's Word more. After we finish studying it, we will be able to tell whether it's God's voice naturally. Jiang, you've accepted Almighty God's work in the last days in China, right? Yes, brother. I would just like to talk about it with you. Jiang, you've just come back from China. Have a good rest first. All right, then. Then, tomorrow we'll meet with some friends. They're very interested in Almighty God's work of the last days. We'll fellowship then. That's great. Well, go ahead. <laughs> As we're all aware, we're in the final age of the last days. Most of the biblical prophecies of the Lord's return have come to pass. We know the Lord Jesus is supposed to come now. There are those who believe the Lord has come. They are probably right. So our investigating into Almighty God's work in the last days means a lot in terms of welcoming the return of the Lord. Since there will be many false Christs in the last days, people give much attention to the prevention of them. But they're forgetting the last days is the time, the very time for the appearance of God, the time for Lord Jesus to come back. If guarding against false Christs is all we focus on, without taking the initiative to seek God's appearance or to investigate God's work, then, truly, it is pathetic for us. For us to welcome the Lord Jesus' return, we must know how to tell the true Christ from the false ones. This relates directly to our rapture before the throne of God. But still, we don't quite understand the truth of this discernment. But we must learn how to discern. So, we want Sister Cho to fellowship with us about how to recognize the true Christ. This is the truth we need most right now. As we know, now deception from false Christs occurs in every country. Even here, many are fooled into believing false Christs. This has just fulfilled the Lord Jesus' prophecy. Then if any man shall say to you, See, here is Christ, or there, Believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, so that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. I think all news preaching the Lord is returned is false personally. We can't believe it. Otherwise, we'll be fooled. Now, am I right or wrong in this opinion? Help me, please, with your fellowship. Well, from the time Almighty God starts expressing the truth and begins doing the work of judgment in the last days, then mankind has entered into the age of kingdom. That age has begun, but if people still remain in the age of grace, then they are falling behind. Then they are left behind by God's work, when the Lord Jesus has come again in secret to start the work of judgment beginning with the house of God, many false Christs and deceivers will appear at the same time to imitate and disturb God's work. And so, when the false Christs begin appearing, it means that God has already returned and He has arrived in secret, but the people just don't know about it yet. This is an opportunity for us to seek and to investigate God's work in the last days. However, regarding the return of the Lord, many people take guarding against false Christs as their priority. 
They pay no attention to how to hear God's voice like wise virgins or how to welcome the return of the Lord. Instead, they cling to their notions and imaginations, thinking anyone who witnesses the Lord Jesus' return is false. Aren't they the foolish virgins mentioned by the Lord Jesus? Haven't they also condemned the returned Lord Jesus? The question I would like to ask is, do these kinds of people really genuinely believe in the return of the Lord Jesus? Aren't they, in behaving like this, just denying His return? That's right. Pastor Lee, we shouldn't deny the testimonies of the Lord's coming just because of the appearance of the false Christs of the last days. If so, don't we give up eating for fear of choking? Discernment between the true Christ and false ones is the best means of revealing whether a person has truth or not. And it also reveals if a person is a wise virgin or a foolish one. Some people just take this verse as evidence enough to judge and condemn the incarnate Christ and deny Christ's arrival. They appear foolish by that. But for us to distinguish the true Christ from all the false ones, we all should know the substance of Christ as a beginning. As we all know, the Lord Jesus is the incarnate Christ. Christ is the incarnate God. That is, the God in heaven takes on a flesh and becomes the Son of Man to work in the world. Christ is the embodiment of the Spirit of God. He has the divine substance, the almightiness, wisdom, disposition of the Spirit of God, and all that God has and is have been realized in Christ. Christ is the truth, and He is the way and the life. Hence, we can say for sure that Christ is not a vague God, not fictional or illusory. He is real and practical, worthy for man to rely on and trust. He is the practical God that can be followed and be known by man. Just like the Lord Jesus, who lived in the human world completely real and vivid, accomplishing His work of leading men and of shepherding them. After we know the substance of Christ, it's easier for us to distinguish the true Christ from the false ones. Let's read a passage of Almighty God's Word. Please turn to page 3. Pastor Kim, will you please read for us? Yes. To study such a thing is not difficult, but requires each of us to know this truth. He, who is God's incarnation, shall hold the substance of God, and he, who is God's incarnation, shall hold the expression of God. Since God becomes flesh, he shall bring forth the work he must do. And since God becomes flesh, he shall express what he is and shall be able to bring the truth to man, bestow life upon man, and show man the way. Flesh that does not contain the substance of God is surely not the incarnate God. Of this there is no doubt. To investigate whether it is God's incarnate flesh, man must determine this from the disposition he expresses and the words he speaks, which is to say, whether or not it is God's incarnate flesh and whether or not it is the true way must be judged from his substance. And so, in determining whether it is the flesh of God incarnate, the key is to pay attention to his substance, his works, his words, his disposition, and many more, rather than external appearance. 
If man sees only his external appearance and overlooks his substance, then that shows man's ignorance and naivete. Let's stop it here. In the Age of Grace, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He expressed a great deal of truth, mainly manifested his disposition of love and compassion, and accomplished God's work of redeeming all mankind. Lord Jesus' work and his word and his disposition, they prove completely that Christ is the truth and the life and also the way. In the last days, Almighty God comes and says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. He expresses millions of words and opens the scroll, displays his main disposition that is righteous, and does the judgment work in the last days. Almighty God's work of judgment and chastisement to save corrupt mankind has once again proved Christ is the truth and the life and also the way. The Lord Jesus prophesied a long time ago he would come in the last days to do the work of judgment and in the way of becoming flesh as the Son of Man, as the appearance of the Son of Man, he would come into the world and speak to the churches. Almighty God's work, we know, has fulfilled quite exactly the Lord Jesus' prophesied return. We can see that if He is the true incarnate Christ, He is able to express the truth and God's disposition, able to do God's work of judgment in the last days, able to conquer, save, and purify man, and able to carry out God's will and also to be His testimony. Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. All the truth He expresses definitely will conquer the entire, quite corrupt humanity as a whole. It will bring all those who truly believe in God before God's throne. Surely, Christ will accomplish completely all God's work of the last days. This is definitely a fact. Yes, exactly. False Christs are just evil spirits claiming to be Christ. They are no more than deceivers. Most of them are possessed by evil spirits. Even if they are not actually possessed, they are very arrogant and unreasonable devils. So they dare claim to be Christ. Fake Christs commit the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and they inevitably are sure to be cursed. This is because they have the substance of evil spirits. In fact, all of these many false Christs are without truth and are nothing more than deceiving devils, which means all they have to offer are fallacies and lies and can't convince others thoroughly. What they say and what they act can't be shown to the public or put on the internet for all people to investigate because false Christs are dark and evil spirits, evil and in fear of the light. All they can do is perform some simple signs and wonders to deceive those foolish and ignorant people in dark corners. Therefore, we'll say with certainty, people who proclaim themselves to be Christ but deceive others by displaying some signs and wonders are nothing but false Christs. Every one of the truths that have ever been expressed by Almighty God, Christ of the last days, have been published on the internet, open to the whole of mankind. All true believers who love the truth seek the true way, and they have returned one by one before the throne of Almighty God in order to accept the judgment, purification, and perfection of God's Word, which is widely known, of course. The deeds and words of the false Christs are totally different from those of the Christ in the flesh. This is easy to discern for whoever understands the truth. Your fellowship is incredibly clear. Only he who can express truth 
and do the judgment work of the last days is the incarnate God, the appearance of Christ of the last days. False Christ, without truth, are unable to do the work of God. Those who falsely claim and rely on making a show of some signs, wonders, lies, and fallacies in order to deceive us are false Christs. This is the correct method to determine the true Christ from the false. Right. I believe this is the absolute key that will unlock discernment. Therefore, it's the most exact way we can discern the true Christ from false, according to the principle that Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. Jesus has said that God's sheep hear God's voice, the wise virgins are able to recognize the voice of God. The voice of God is a voice that is known to them. The wise virgins can discover truths from the voice of the bridegroom, find God's disposition, and they can also find what God has and is in His words, and then can understand the will of God. So they will be accepting of God's work and will return before the throne of God. Why aren't foolish virgins able to recognize the voice of the bridegroom? The reason is that foolish virgins are completely unable to discern the truth, are unable to discern the voice of God. All they can keep are regulations. Thus, they will all be exposed and be eliminated by the work of God in the last days. The mystery of the wise virgins is, whoever can recognize the genuine voice of God, from the truth expressed by Christ of the last days, is a wise virgin and will be accepting of God's work and will follow the footsteps of the Lamb. But the foolish virgins blindly follow doctrines, only focus on guarding against false Christs, but not on distinguishing God's voice. Thus, they are revealed and eliminated by God's work of the last days. It is true that God's sheep hear His voice. There is another method to discern the true Christ from all the false ones, and that's according to the principle that God never repeats His work. God is always new and never old. Let us read from the words of Almighty God. Please turn to page 956. If in the last days a God, the same as Jesus, appeared, one who healed the sick, cast out demons, and was crucified for man. That God, though identical to the description of God in the Bible, and easy for man to accept, would not, in its essence, be the Spirit of God clothed in flesh, but an evil spirit clothed in flesh. For it is the principle of God's work never to repeat what He has already completed. If, during the last days, God still displayed signs and wonders and still cast out demons and healed, if He did exactly the same as Jesus, then God would be repeating the same work, and the work of Jesus would have no significance or value. Thus, God carries out one stage of work in every age. Once each stage of his work has been completed, it is soon imitated by evil spirits, and after Satan begins to follow on the heels of God, God changes to a different method. Once God has completed a stage of his work, it is imitated by evil spirits. You must be clear about these things. Almighty God's Word makes it clear that He does not repeat His work. For example, when the Lord Jesus came to do His work, He didn't repeat the work of the Age of Law, but carried out His work of redeeming humanity upon the foundation of the work in the Age of Law, ending the Age of Law and opening the Age of Grace. In the last days, Almighty God comes here to end the age of grace and to begin the age of kingdom.
He does the work of judging and purifying man, which is based upon the work of redemption the Lord Jesus did. And he gives people all truth they need in order to achieve salvation, resolves men's corrupt disposition, and resolves men's sinful nature as well, saves men thoroughly from the influence of Satan, and makes men attain sanctity and be fully gained by God. Thus, God's management work of saving man will come to an end completely, which lets us see God's work is always moving and progressing forward, always going higher and deeper at every step. In God's work, there is never any repetition. However, false Christs can only deceive people by imitating some simple signs and wonders the Lord Jesus did. Such large miracles of Jesus like raising the dead or the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, these could never be accomplished by false Christs and evil spirits. Also, it is the case that false Christs are even less capable of expressing the truth because they are evil spirits and devils in substance. False Christs are without truth, so they lie with their words so they'll be able to fool and cheat men. Well, your fellowship does make sense. You say Almighty God has Jesus returned and has expressed many words, but... They are returned Christ impersonators around. They also say much. Some of them have written books even, and they actually have followers. How are we to discern the words of these false Christs? I would like to hear your views. The words expressed by Almighty God are all truths, with authority. But there is no truth in false Christ's words. They are preposterous and ridiculous. How could they ever be compared to the word of Almighty God? Right. The word of Almighty God is the truth. Whoever reads it will be sincerely and utterly convinced. Evil spirit is the substance of those various false Christs around. They spout fallacies and lies. They're scared to say them in newspapers or on the internet or be exposed to the light. They fear most that people will investigate, for then how could they be the truth? Pastor Lee, you have served the Lord for many years. You should have better discernment. Every word of Almighty God is very much the truth, full of power and authority, shaking and waking people's hearts. Except for the incarnate Christ, absolutely nobody could speak it. Pastor Lee, you have been reading the Bible and preaching for decades. I certainly believe you must be able to see such a point. Well, of course. I surely find that, yes. Of course the word of Almighty God is the truth. I don't deny it. As you all know, some false Christ deceive by expounding the Bible and prophecies. But my question is, how is it possible for us to discern all of these false Christs? Discerning the true actual Christ from all the false ones is of the utmost importance to us in terms of welcoming the Lord's coming again. Only those who can discern the true Christ from the many false ones can accept the work of God in the last days and then be lifted before the throne. All of those who are unable to undertake this important discernment, they are the foolish virgins. In the end, they will surely be forsaken or eliminated by God. The key to the false Christ's discernment is in seeing through their substance. False Christs are possessed by evil spirits. Evil spirit is their substance. They don't have any reality of the truth. Their words are full of lies, full of nonsense, lies and fallacies also, and the confounding of black and white. They know people all worship Bible knowledge and want to learn about all the mysteries of the Bible. So because they know men think in this way, they deceive people by misinterpreting the Bible, expounding it out of context, and airing varied weird views. Their fallacies sound unusual and very original, 
as if their interpretation of the Bible is quite profound and mysterious. But can that prove their words are the truth? What then is the truth? The truth is what God has and is, and the reality of all things positive, which represents God's disposition. And it is the truth that enables mankind to know God, the truth that can be the life of man, can save, cleanse, change, and perfect man. False Christs expound the Bible and talk about some weird ideas. But could that be the truth? Could that be used to change and to perfect man? Tell me also, could that make man know and obey God? And could that make man discern Satan and hate Satan? Could that make man break away from Satan's influence of darkness? If all their words can't achieve the effect of improving man's spiritual life, then they are fallacies and heresies and devilish words. God's work is practical. The real incarnate Almighty God in the last days has expressed the truths that can save mankind. These truths can help man to know God, break away from under Satan's influence to attain real salvation, to become a person who worships God and also obeys God, and live out the likeness of a real man, live a righteous and meaningful life. This is what I believe to be the work of God. If what people are believing in and following is the true Christ, if they follow the incarnate God, then they will know many truths. Once they've believed eight or ten years or so, their faith, love, and obedience to God will all increase gradually as they go. Their life disposition will also have some changes. Only with these results can it prove that one is believing in Christ, that one is believing in the true God. Many people believe in false Christs for eight or ten years, but never gain any truth or any knowledge of the true God, not to mention love and faith or obedience to God. Isn't it then true that such people have been tricked? These false Christs and evil spirits don't have the truth. This means they can never do the work of God at all. All the words of Almighty God are expressions of the disposition of God in what He has and is, and this cannot be spoken and cannot be imitated by false Christs and evil spirits. False Christs deceive people by using the Bible out of context and misinterpreting the Bible, or else by giving people blessings and promises and pretending they are in the name of the Lord Jesus. It won't benefit people's life entry at all, though. And it isn't going to bring a new way either, much less open a new age. The work of false Christs and evil spirits won't last long. They'll soon break up in an uproar, and they will completely disappear and perish of themselves. This is a fact. Only what is from God will surely prevail and stand. If it's really the work of Christ, it can achieve the result of saving and of perfecting man. It can carry out the will of God, can open an age, and can end the age. This is quite definite. Because God is almighty, the truth that God expresses will exist forever. Even if heaven and earth were to pass away, the word of God wouldn't pass away. Sister Cho, you have explained that false Christs deceive by distorting the Bible and showing signs and wonders, and I feel like I'm sincerely clear in my understanding of these things now. But I do have another question. It's just that some of the false Christs say God's Spirit descends upon them. They claim they're the return of the Lord Jesus and deceive some people. Tell me, please, how do you discern them? 
I'm happy to explain. It's quite easy to discern. Listen, Christ is the incarnate God and is the flesh that God's Spirit is realized in. It's not after God's Spirit descends upon Him that He becomes Christ. Christ is born to be Christ, and He is Christ from His birth. And just as He was born as Christ, He is Christ forever. But not born as Christ, He will never become Christ. Yes. Just like the Lord Jesus was Christ from His birth, not only after the Holy Spirit descended upon Him. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon Him like a dove, as is reflected in the words, and see a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This was the testimony of the Holy Spirit, letting all men know that the Lord Jesus was the incarnate God Himself. From then on, the Lord Jesus officially performed His ministry and did the work of the Age of Grace. And in the last days, the incarnate Almighty God comes and expresses the truth to testify He is Christ, the incarnate flesh of God. The substance of Christ is the life, the truth, and the way. Thus, Christ will surely express the truth when He comes to work. However, those false Christs may very well declare that God's Spirit descends upon them, but they just can't express the truth at all. And it's enough to prove they are evil spirits who claim to be Christ to deceive people. Therefore, those false Christs that claim the Spirit of God has actually descended upon them? They are, in fact, actually possessed by evil spirits. This is the truth. Listen, it is just as Almighty God has said. Turn to page 543. There are some who are possessed by evil spirits and persistently cry out, I am God. Yet in the end, they cannot remain standing, for they act on behalf of the wrong being. They represent Satan, and the Holy Spirit pays them no attention. However emphatically you speak, or strongly you cry out, you are still a created being and one that belongs to Satan. You cannot bring forth new paths or represent the Spirit. You cannot express the work of the Spirit or the words that He speaks. You cannot do the work of God Himself or that of the Spirit. You cannot express the wisdom, wonder, and unfathomableness of God or all the disposition by which God chastises man. So your repeated claims to be God do not matter. You have only the name and none of the substance. God Himself has come, but none recognize Him. Yet He continues on in His work and does so in representation of the Spirit. He is the incarnate flesh of the Spirit of God. He represents the Spirit and is approved by Him. You cannot make way for a new age and you cannot bring the old to an end and cannot usher in a new age or do new work. Therefore, you cannot be called God. Christ is indeed the flesh that God's Spirit is realized in. He is Christ from His birth, and it is not after the Holy Spirit descends upon Him that he, in fact, becomes Christ. Ah, I see. Your fellowship has made this very clear. Whether one is Christ is just not up to himself. And if he is unable to express the truth that saves and judges man, if he cannot do the work of judgment in the last days, 
cannot initiate a new age or end the old age. He must be fake, even if he calls himself Christ. Almighty God, the incarnate Christ of the last days, expresses all truth that judges and truth that cleanses man as well, does the work of judgment beginning with the house of God, ends the age of grace, and ushers in the age of kingdom. Almighty God's word is the expression of God's disposition in what God has and is, and the reality of life man should possess. His word helps to solve all problems of corrupt mankind's resisting and betraying God. It's extremely important as well as extremely precious for all of mankind to know God's work, disposition, and substance. Almighty God reveals all the mysteries of God's 6,000-year management plan and the true story and substance of God's three-stage work. It also reveals how Satan corrupts mankind, how God saves mankind step by step, the necessity and significance of God doing the work of judgment in the last days, how mankind can solve their sinful nature and break away from Satan's influence to find salvation, how to be the one who does the will of the Heavenly Father, who is saved by God and, of course, in addition, who will be eliminated by Him. Who can be lifted into the kingdom of heaven? How to divide good and evil? And how God determines the ending for man, and so on. Every mystery and truth involving man's salvation and involving his perfection Yes, Almighty God has uncovered all of this for man. This fulfills the Lord Jesus' prophecy, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. What Almighty God does is the work of the Age of Kingdom and the work of ending the dark and evil old world. The truth He expresses and the work He does fully and completely have proven that Almighty God is Christ of the last days. The Lord Jesus returned. You're very right. Christ can open up a new age and conclude the old age and express the truth to do his work of judgment in the last days, while false Christs are evil spirits in substance and have no truth. So by no means can they express the truth or do God's work. And they can't bring forth new paths or open up a new age. The only thing they're doing is misinterpreting the Bible out of context and deceiving people with lies. Obviously, false Christs are doing the work of Satan evil spirits. They're corrupting mankind. That's right. The devil is a liar since the very beginning. In South Korea, we see often false Christs giving false prophecies and testimonies. They say God's day will come on such and such a day. They're just deceiving people. None of their words have ever been realized. Those false Christs, evil spirits, and deceivers won't last long. It won't be very long until they will be rejected and exposed. There are so many of such things. That's right. After hearing your fellowship, we are all clear about the truth of distinguishing between the true Christ and the false. It is helpful for us to seek the true way. Now, all over the world, nobody but Almighty God expresses the truth to save mankind and does the work of judgment in the last days. The book of Almighty God's Word which is called The Word Appears in the Flesh, has already been posted on the internet for the whole world to investigate. It tells of the descent of the kingdom of heaven and has spread across the world. Could it be? Almighty God is really the one, the Son of Man the Bible prophesied, Christ of the last days. In the world at this time, Almighty God alone is doing the work of judgment. 
The word of truth that he expresses has been released in papers and on the internet, welcoming all men's investigation. Now it seems that Almighty God is probably Christ of the last days, is the one we are waiting for. That's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh Lord, we sincerely long for your appearance. Amen. We are now seeking your voice and seeking your work. Amen. May you enlighten us and lead us. Amen. Lord, you're aware of what we lack. We ask that your spirit would guide us. Amen. So that we can hear your voice, so we can see your appearance and so that we can obey your work. Amen. We don't want to be abandoned. Amen. Oh, Lord, Lord, do not reject us. We're willing to be wise virgins so we can hear your voice, so we can accept you and obey you, and so we can also attend the feast Amen. with you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Though many people believe in God, few understand what faith in God means and what they must do to be after God's heart. This is because, though people are familiar with the word God and phrases such as the work of God, they do not know God, much less do they know His work. No wonder, then, that all those who do not know God are possessed of a muddled belief. Belief in God means believing that there is a God. This is the simplest concept of faith in God. What's more, believing that there is a God is not the same as truly believing in God. Rather, it is a kind of simple faith with strong religious overtones. True faith in God means experiencing the words and work of God based on a belief that God holds sovereignty over all things. So you shall be freed of your corrupt disposition, shall fulfill the desire of God, and shall come to know God. Only through such a journey can you be said to believe in God. These words of Almighty God are so practical. With several words, He makes the truth of belief in God clear. I've believed in the Lord for so many years, but still didn't know what faith in God is. I thought more prayer, more reading the Bible, holding on to the Bible, and taking up the cross to follow the Lord made the firmest faith in God. But really, believing in God requires experiencing the words of God and experiencing God's work. And only then can we gain the truth and the knowledge about God. The words of Almighty God sincerely do enlighten me. Oh, yes. The word of Almighty God, indeed, solves the practical problems for us believers in God, corrects our deviation in believing in God, and helps by pointing out the right way of practice. And it also makes us understand the truth. It's a tremendous help. Mm. Please read this passage. When Jesus came into the world of man, he brought the age of grace 
and ended the age of law. During the last days, God once more became flesh. And when he became flesh this time, the age of grace ended and the age of kingdom began. All those who accept the second incarnation of God will be led into the age of kingdom and be able to personally accept the guidance of God. Though Jesus did much work among man, he only completed the redemption of all mankind and became man's sin offering and did not rid man of all his corrupt disposition. Fully saving man from the influence of Satan not only required Jesus to take on the sins of man as the sin offering, but also required God to do greater work to completely rid man of his disposition, which has been corrupted by Satan. And so, after man was forgiven his sins, God returned to flesh to lead man into the new age and began the work of chastisement and judgment, which brought man to a higher realm. All those who submit under his dominion shall enjoy higher truth and receive greater blessings. They shall truly live in the light and shall gain the truth, the way, and the life. When God becomes flesh this time, his work will be to express his disposition primarily through chastisement and judgment. Using this as the foundation, he brings more truths to man, shows more ways of practice, and so achieves his objective of conquering man and saving man from his corrupt disposition. This is what lies behind the work of God in the Age of Kingdom. Hmm. Here are more passages of God's words. Let me read to you. Through this work of judgment and chastisement, man will fully come to know the filthy and corrupt substance within him. And he will be able to completely change and become clean. Only in this way can man be worthy to return before the throne of God. All the work done this day is so that man can be made clean and be changed through judgment and chastisement by the word, as well as refinement, man can cast away his corruption and be made pure. Rather than deeming this stage of work to be that of salvation, it would be more apt to say it is the work of purification. In truth, this stage is that of conquest as well as the second stage of salvation. Man is gained by God through judgment and chastisement by the Word. Through the use of the Word to refine, judge, and disclose all of the impurities, notions, motives, and individual hopes within man's heart are completely revealed. Almighty God's explanation is so clear about the work of the Age of Grace and that of the age of kingdom. In the age of grace, God merely did the work of redemption and didn't do the work of changing man's disposition. It's in the age of kingdom that God does the work of transforming man's disposition. No wonder. We always keep sinning and can never break free from the constraint and from the bondage of sin. Finally, I find the root of the problem. After reading Almighty God's words, I have a path to follow. I'm lightened inside. 
Precisely. Almighty God makes it so clear about the work in the Age of Grace and in the Age of Kingdom. We would never understand these truths unless we read the Word from Almighty God. You're right. It seems like the work of God. We should read Almighty God's Word more and study it well. The word expressed by Almighty God is the truth, and God's voice for sure. Nevertheless, words of famous spiritual men have always edified people much. They're in accord with the truth in our eyes. What's the difference between their words and the words of the incarnate God? To ascertain whether Almighty God is the returned Lord Jesus, we must figure this question out. I really don't think it's an urgent question, as long as we pray to the Lord and study the Bible. He will enlighten us sooner or later. The Lord Jesus said, Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. We had better go directly to the Church of Almighty God to seek and investigate, listen to their fellowship, and they could lay all of our confusion to rest. What? Go to the Church of Almighty God? Yeah. I talked to Jiang, and she told me, they hold a weekly session for those who want to investigate the true way. Why don't we attend it then? Great. I like the idea. Okay. It's settled then. Well, what do you think? Hello, everyone. Nice, nice to meet you. All of you have read the word that Almighty God expresses and come to the Church of Almighty God to investigate God's work in the last days. It really is quite a blessed thing. We warmly welcome you to this meeting. To investigate God's work in the last days, we should read and investigate Almighty God's Word more, in order that all of us might see whether His expression is God's words and work, whether that is God's judgment and revelation, and whether it's the truth that can purify and save man. We should see whether He manifests God's disposition and what God has and is and whether or not he reveals all the mysteries of God's work. By these, we can ascertain whether all the words expressed by Almighty God are the utterance of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. In addition, we should keep in mind that the incarnate God is a son of man, very ordinary outwardly. While he possesses the substance of divinity, is able to express many truths to purify and save man and is able to express God's word and utter God's voice. All these are mysteries unfathomable to man, and the truths we must understand while seeking the true way. Of course we cannot be absolutely certain of the true way just by asking several questions or by just fellowshipping for a few days. God's work of judgment in the last days 
is a work of ending the age as well as the last stage of work in God's management plan. You see, Almighty God has expressed several million words to date, which, as you might know, is exactly God's work of judgment in the last days. If there are merely several pieces of God's word or revelation, then that cannot be said to be God's work, but the work that prophets tell God's word. Therefore, everyone, while investigating Almighty God's work in the last days, we can make it only by seeking some very crucial truths. If there's anything that's unclear regarding Almighty God's work in the last days, please feel free to ask us. Now we are open to questions. I have a question. We've been investigating Almighty God's work in the last days. Here's the question. You testify Almighty God is the incarnate God and does God's work of judgment in the last days. But God incarnate is the most difficult for us to recognize. Like in South Korea, a great many people take man's work as God's work. And many even take false Christ's words as God's work to accept and to follow and then end up deceived into following Satan. Can you please fellowship about how to tell the difference between the work of God incarnate and the work of men used by God. We are in urgent need to understand the truth in this aspect. That is a good question. The work fulfilled by Lord Jesus was God's work, and the work performed by his apostles was also from God. Isn't all that comes from God also the work of God? I don't see any difference at all. Me neither. Doesn't the work of men used by God come from the guidance of the Holy Spirit? They do God's work too. Only those not led by the Holy Spirit are doing man's work. Oh, I think you have it wrong. How is it possible that God's work could be the same as man's work? The Lord Jesus was crucified for man to forgive them their sins. Can man do his work instead? No. Definitely there are differences between the work of God incarnate and the work of men used by God. It's just that our understanding towards the truth is too shallow to tell the differences. Let's hear the fellowship of brothers and sisters from the Church of Almighty God. Yes, there are surely some distinct differences between God's work and man's work, and we will find them if we examine carefully. For example, when we compare the words and work of Lord Jesus with the words and work of those apostles, we find the obvious differences. Every word of the Lord Jesus is the truth, filled with authority, and is able to reveal lots of mysteries, none of which can be achieved by man. And that is why so many people follow the Lord Jesus after all. However, those apostles could only preach the gospel to testify about God and supply the church, and the results of their work were very limited. Then why is man unable to discern what are such obvious differences between God's work and man's work? What is the reason for this? It's because corrupt mankind has no knowledge, either of God or truth at all, that they don't know the difference between God's work and man's. And they're prone to treat the work of God incarnate as man's work and to take the work of those they adore, evil spirits, false Christs, and false prophets, as the work of God to accept and follow. It's straying from the true way and resisting God. It's adoring man, following and worshiping Satan, which is something that's gravely against God's disposition and cursed by God. Such people will thus lose the chance of salvation. So the question you asked, is fairly important for man to seek the true way and know God's work in the last days. The work of God incarnate and the work of men used by God both seem to be humans working and speaking outwardly, but there is a world of difference between their substances and the natures of their work. Today, Almighty God comes and reveals the entirety of truth and mystery. Almighty God reveals the difference between God's work and the work of man. For only then do we have some knowledge and discernment in terms of God's work and man's work. 
Let's read the word of Almighty God. Please turn to page 874. Yes, I'll read it. The work of God himself involves the work of all of mankind, and it also represents the work of the entire era. That is to say, God's own work represents the movement and trend of all of the work of the Holy Spirit whereas the work of the apostles follows God's own work and does not lead the era, nor does it represent the working trend of the Holy Spirit in the entire era. They only do the work man ought to do, which does not at all involve the management work. God's own work is the project within the management work. Man's work is only the duty of men being used and bears no relation to the management work. The work of God incarnate begins a new era, and those who continue His work are the men who are used by Him. The work done by man is all within the ministry of God in the flesh and is incapable of going beyond this scope. If God incarnate does not come to do His work, Man is not able to bring the old age to an end and is not able to usher in a new era. The work done by man is merely within the range of his duty that is humanly possible and does not represent the work of God. Only the incarnate God can come and complete the work that he should do. And apart from him, no one can do this work on his behalf. Of course, what I speak of is in regard with the work of incarnation. He who is God's incarnation shall hold the substance of God, and he who is God's incarnation shall hold the expression of God. Since God becomes flesh, he shall bring forth the work he must do. And since God becomes flesh, he shall express what he is, and shall be able to bring the truth to man bestow life upon man, and show man the way. Flesh that does not contain the substance of God is surely not the incarnate God. Of this there is no doubt. The words of God incarnate initiate a new age, guide the whole of mankind, reveal mysteries, and give man the direction ahead in a new age. The enlightenment obtained by man is but simple practice or knowledge. It cannot guide the whole of mankind into a new age or reveal the mystery of God himself. God, after all, is God, and man is man. God has the substance of God, and man has the substance of man. The incarnate God is substantively different from the people used by God. The incarnate God can do the work of divinity, but the people used by God cannot. At the beginning of each age, God's Spirit speaks personally to launch the new era and bring man to a new beginning. When he finishes his speaking, it signifies that God's work in divinity is done. Thereafter, people all follow the lead of those used by God to enter life experience. I'll continue. What God expresses is what God himself is. And this is beyond the reach of man. That is, beyond the reach of man's thinking. He expresses his work of leading all of mankind. And this is not relevant to the details of human experience, but is instead concerned with his own management. Man expresses his experience while God expresses his being. This being is his inherent disposition and is beyond the reach of man. Man's experience is his seeing and knowledge acquired based on God's expression of his being. Such seeing and knowledge are called man's being. They are expressed on the foundation of man's inherent disposition and his actual qualities. 
Hence, they are also called man's being. The words spoken by God's incarnate flesh are the direct expression of the Spirit and express the work that has been done by the Spirit. The flesh has not experienced or seen it, but still expresses His being, because the substance of the flesh is the Spirit, and He expresses the work of the Spirit. If man were to do this work, then it would be too limited. It could take people to a certain point, but it would not be able to bring people to the eternal destination. Man is not able to decide their destiny, nor, moreover, is he able to ensure their prospects and future destination. The work done by God, however, is different. Since he created man, he leads him. Since he saves man, he will thoroughly save him and will completely gain him. Since he leads man, he will bring him to the proper destination. And since he created and manages man, he must take responsibility for man's fate and prospects. It is this which is the work done by the Creator. You see that the words of Almighty God make very clear the difference between the work of God and the work of man. Since the incarnate God and the people used by God are different in substance, their works are totally different. God incarnate is ordinary and normal in terms of his appearance, but he is the flesh God's spirit is realized in. He has divine substance, God's authority, power, almightiness, and wisdom. Thus, God incarnate can directly express the truth, God's righteous disposition, and what God has and is in his work. He alone can usher in the new age and conclude the old, reveal all the mysteries in God's management plan, and can speak all of God's will and God's requirements for man. All the words God incarnate expresses are the truth, and they can be man's life, and they can also change man's life disposition. So, the work of God incarnate can conquer and purify man, deliver man from the influence of Satan, and take mankind into a wonderful destination. Such results cannot be achieved by any work of man. God incarnate does the work of God himself. And the work cannot be done by any man in his stead. Whereas the people used by God are human. They all have merely humanity and don't possess the divine substance of Christ. Thus, they cannot express the truth, God's disposition, and cannot express what God has and is. All they can do is fellowship about their knowledge of God's words on the foundation of God's words and work, or talk about their own experiences and testimony. Both their knowledge and testimony represent their personal understanding and viewpoint of God's words. So no matter how high and reasonable their knowledge sounds, it isn't the truth, much less is it God's words, and therefore cannot become man's life. They can only bring man some help, supply, support, and edification, but they cannot achieve the effect of purifying, saving, and perfecting man. Thus, the people used by God are unable to do the work of God himself and can merely cooperate with God's work and perform their duty. As to the difference between God's work and man's work, let me give you an example to show the difference more clearly for everyone. In the age of grace, the Lord Jesus brought the way, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He unlocked the mystery about the kingdom of heaven, offered himself as the sin offering, did the work of redeeming mankind, and asked man to confess and repent. They were forgiven of their sins, spared of the law's condemnation and curse, 
and qualified to come before God to pray and commune with Him. They enjoyed His abundant grace and truth and saw God's merciful and compassionate disposition. The Lord Jesus' work opened up the age of grace and concluded the age of law. This was God's work in the age of grace. After the Lord Jesus finished His work, His apostles, based on His work and word, started to lead God's chosen people to experience and practice the Lord Jesus' words. They proclaimed and witnessed the Lord Jesus' salvation, spread the gospel of His redemption of mankind to the end of the earth. This was the work of the apostles in the age of grace, that is, the work of the people used by God. It tells us that there are substantial differences between the Lord Jesus' work and the apostles' work. The incarnate Almighty God of the last days expresses all the truths to purify and save mankind and reveals all mysteries in God's 6,000-year management plan and conducts the work of judgment beginning with the house of God, thoroughly freeing man from Satan's corruption and influence as well, and showing man God's righteous, majestic, wrathful disposition and his intolerance of offense as well. Thus, you see, corrupt man is delivered from sins, attains holiness, and then can be gained by God. Almighty God's work initiates the age of kingdom and concludes the age of grace. This is God's work in the age of kingdom. The work of the man used by God is to water and shepherd God's chosen people based on Almighty God's work and word, and to lead them into the reality of God's word and onto the right track of believing in God and to spread and witness Almighty God's gospel of the descent of the kingdom. This is the work of the man used by God in the age of kingdom. It shows us that what God does in these two incarnations are the initiation of an age and the conclusion of one. They're aimed at the whole of mankind. Both incarnations are to accomplish a stage of work in God's management plan, which is exactly the work of redeeming and saving mankind. God's works in His two incarnations prove that only God's work can bring the necessary truth to purify and to save mankind. There is no one who can do God's work instead. So we can see absolutely only God incarnate is capable of undertaking the special work of God. So God's two incarnations witness that only Christ is really the truth and the way and the life. Except the incarnate God, no one can possibly do God's own work. No one can initiate an age and conclude an age, much less save mankind. The work of the man used by God is only in cooperation with God's work. Men can only proceed with their duty to lead and shepherd God's chosen people. No matter how long men have worked, how much they have talked, or how great men's work appears. They are, in fact, still men's work in essence. This is the major difference between the work of God incarnate and the work of the man used by God. Almighty God's word states so clearly the difference between the work that is done by God incarnate and the work of the man used by God. After all these years of Bible reading, we don't understand this truth. It seems the word of Almighty God is indeed the truth. Yes, Almighty God's word is well said. After your fellowship, we understand. The work done by God incarnate is to open an age and to end one also. However, no matter how much work the man used by God does, he simply cannot initiate a new age or go beyond the scope of God's work and word. Such a fellowship really enlightens me. Yes, Almighty God's Word shows us the substantial difference between the work of God and the work of man, illustrating how different they are. We have just realized that He who is God incarnate is the one who can express the truth, the one who can display God's disposition and can express what God has and is. If man accepts and experiences God's work, 
then they will come to understand the truth, know more and more about God's holiness and righteousness and God's substance and His intention of saving man, the ways of God of saving man and God's remarkable love for man. Meanwhile, they will know their nature, substance, and real situation of their being corrupted by Satan. In that way, their corrupt disposition will be cleansed and transformed. They will have true obedience and fear of God and be granted salvation. However, man's work is so different from God's work. For man can't express the truth, but is only capable of talking about some experience and knowledge about God's word. Though in line with the truth, it can only lead, shepherd, sustain, and help God's chosen people. And obviously, all those people who are approved by God can only cooperate with the work of God. They're just performing man's duty. However, those who are not used by God or devoid of the Holy Spirit's work boast about man's gifts, talents, and fame. Even when they interpret the scriptures, they're exalting man's words in the Bible, ignoring God's words and replacing them. The work of such people is all the work of the Pharisees. All of them is resisting God. Such are the two main kinds of man's work. Well, in any case, the biggest difference between man's work and God's work is that man's work alone can't achieve the result of purifying and saving man, while the work of God can purify man and can save man also by expressing the truth. This is a fact. All that I said above refers to the difference between God's work and the work of the people used by God, and it doesn't refer to the work of those religious heads who are not used by God. Since the work of God is so different from the work that is man's work, then tell me why people worship and follow man when they should believe in God. Why do many people consider the works of those famous spiritual figures and religious leaders they adore to be God's work? I do wonder. That is really something to think about. And some even take the deception of false Christs and evil spirits to be the work of God. This is all because people have no truth and do not know how to discern man's work from God's work. They don't know the substance of God incarnate and the substance of man. They don't discern what is truth and what is actually just knowledge that's in accord with truth and have no idea how to tell the voice of God from that of man. Besides, because those corrupted by Satan all adore knowledge and gifts very much, they easily treat things from man as the truth, like biblical knowledge, religious doctrines, and theology. These things from man, which are just not in line with the truth, can bring nothing but knowledge to man. They can't give any actual supply to man's life. Much less can they help man know and revere God. This is an undeniable fact. So, no matter how much man works or speaks, no matter how long and great he works, it can't attain the result of purifying and saving man. And man's life won't change. It shows man's work can never replace God's work. Only the work of God can bring a person salvation. Therefore, the work of God, even if for a short time, and even with only limited words, can initiate an age and conclude an age, and can achieve the result of redeeming and saving mankind. This is the apparent difference between God's work and man's work. Only with the discernment between the work of God and the work of man will people not be led to worship or follow man blindly, and they can reject the deception and the control of these false Christs and Antichrists. 
Thereby, people will accept and obey Almighty God's work of the last days, be judged by God, and purified to be granted salvation. If people still cannot discern the work of God from the work of man in the end, they will never escape the deception and control of the false Christs and Antichrists. Such people, though they might believe in God in name, are believing and following and worshiping man, in fact. In truth, it's worshiping idols. It's resisting God and betraying God. If such people persist in their mistake and don't repent, they will offend God's disposition and thus be cursed by God and eliminated by Him. It is just as it is written in Almighty God's words. Turn to page 445. You who follow God with your words had better open your eyes wide to see who it is you truly believe in. Is it God or Satan? If you know that the one you believe in is not God but an idol, you had better not say that you believe in God. And if you do not know who you really believe in, you had better not say that you believe in God. It is blasphemy to say that. Believing in God is not something to be forced. Do not say you believe in me. I have heard it often enough and do not want to hear it again. For the ones you believe in are the idols in your heart and the villains among you. All those who shake their heads when hearing the truth, yet are all smiles when hearing the words of death, are the descendants of Satan and are to be eliminated. Yes, certainly. I couldn't agree more. The truth expressed by Almighty God is really good. We had no discernment before, and even sometimes we thought that the work of man was God's work actually. Thus we blindly believed in man, adored and followed man. We were ignorant fools. People without the truth are so pathetic, though. We should never blindly just adore or follow the priests or elders mm. anymore. Right, I know. That's just worshipping idols. It's blasphemy against God. Such people will be cursed by That's God. That's right. It's very clear to fellowship like this. Whether it's God's work or man's work depends on his substance and the nature of the work that he does. The work of God incarnate is expressing the truth to save mankind, while the work of the man used by God is simply the cooperation of humanity based on God's work. So we've learned Almighty God's work of judging and purifying man in the last days is truly the work of God. Yes. <clears throat> After hearing you testify that Almighty God does the work of judgment in the last days, I searched through the Bible, and I found more than 200 verses prophesy God's work of judgment. You say God comes to do the judgment work of the last days, which is more than backed up by the Bible. But I've got a question. God used Moses to do the work of the age of law. Why then is the work of judgment done by God incarnate personally rather than using man to do it? That's right. In the age of grace, the Lord Jesus became flesh for the sake of crucifixion to save man. That work must be done by God incarnate and can't be replaced by man. Then, why does God do the work of judgment in the last days by incarnation? Can't it be done by man as God did it way back in the age of law? Why is it God's work of judgment in the last days has to be done by God incarnate instead of being done by the man used by God? You ask a very good question. This question is crucial, involving whether man can be raptured before God's throne or whether they can be saved and then enter into the kingdom of heaven. An important question. Almighty God has said many words in answer to this. Let's look at some of the words of Almighty God. Turn to page 44. The work of judgment is God's own work so it must naturally be done by God himself. 
It cannot be done by man in his stead, because judgment is the conquering of man through the truth. It is unquestionable that God still appears as the incarnate image to do this work among men. That is to say, in the last days, Christ shall use the truth to teach men around the earth and to make all truths known to them. This is God's work of judgment. In the last days, Christ uses a variety of truths to teach man, reveal the essence of man, and dissect his words and deeds. These words comprise various truths, such as man's duty, how man should obey God, how man should be loyal to God, how man ought to live out the normal humanity, as well as the wisdom and disposition of God, and so on. These words are all focused on the essence of man and his corrupt disposition. In particular, those words that reveal how man spurns God are spoken in regards to how man is an embodiment of Satan and an enemy force against God. When God does the work of judgment, he does not simply make clear the nature of man with just a few words, but reveals, deals with, and prunes over the long term. Such manner of revelation, dealing, and pruning cannot be substituted with ordinary words, but with the truth that man does not possess at all. Only such manner of work is deemed judgment. Only through such judgment can man be persuaded, be thoroughly convinced into submission to God, and gain true knowledge of God. What the work of judgment brings about is man's understanding of the true face of God and the truth about his rebelliousness. The work of judgment allows man to gain much understanding of the will of God, of the purpose of God's work, and of the mysteries that could not be understood by man. It also allows man to recognize and know his corrupt substance and the roots of his corruption, as well as to discover the ugliness of man. These effects are all brought about by the work of judgment, for the substance of such work is actually the work of opening up the truth, way, and life of God to all those who have faith in him. This work is the work of judgment done by God. No one is more suitable and qualified than God in the flesh. For the work of judging the corruption of man's flesh, Satan can only be fully defeated if God in the flesh judges the corruption of mankind. Being the same as man possessed of normal humanity, God in the flesh can directly judge the unrighteousness of man. This is the mark of his innate holiness and of his extraordinariness. Only God is qualified to and in the position to judge man. For he is possessed of the truth and righteousness, and so he is able to judge man. Those who are without the truth and righteousness are not fit to judge others. Only because of these judgments do you see that God is a righteous God, that God is a holy God. Only because of His holiness and His righteousness does He judge you and pour wrath upon you, that He can reveal His righteous disposition when seeing man's disobedience, and His holiness when seeing man's filthiness, shows that He is God Himself, holy and unblemished despite living in a land of filth. If a man wallows in the mire with others, without holiness or righteous disposition, he would be unqualified to judge others' unrighteousness or make any other judgment upon them. If a man judges others, does he not strike his own face? How can a man who is unclean be qualified to judge others who are also unclean? Only God himself, who is holy, can judge the impure mankind. How can man judge others' sin? How can man see others' sin and be qualified to condemn others? 
If God were unqualified to judge man's sins, how could he be the righteous God himself? When man displays his corrupt disposition, God speaks and judges you, and in this way you see that he is holy. Almighty God has told us clearly the significance of God incarnate doing the work of judgment in the last days. In the last days, God does the work of judgment by expressing the truth, God's righteous disposition, and God's almightiness and wisdom to reveal and judge the satanic nature of corrupt mankind and to save mankind from Satan's influence and transform man's life disposition and to perfect man so they gain the truth, come to know God, and then live out a meaningful life. And such work as saving and perfecting man must be done by none other than God incarnate personally because mankind of the last days are full of satanic disposition, self-conceited and arrogant, crooked and crafty, selfish and base. They have become Satan's descendants and lost their conscience, reason, integrity and dignity, like animals without spirits at all, not having much likeness of a man. To save such an extremely corrupt mankind, God must be incarnated to express His words directly and express His righteous, majestic, and wrathful disposition to judge man, conquer man, and purify man, so that mankind will hear the voice of God and see God's disposition and witness His wrath as well. Thus, the corrupt mankind can be thoroughly conquered and defeated. They will fall on the ground, fear God, obey God, and shun evil. That is the result achieved by God incarnate in doing the work of judgment. You see, God incarnate not merely expresses God's words, but most importantly, He allows mankind to see God's appearance and disposition, the deeds of God, the almightiness of God, and His wisdom as well. And they'll see that God's tabernacle is among man. God lives with man. And man lives before God, while communicating with God and speaking to Him directly. All of that is indeed fulfilled by God incarnate. That is, the true meaning of God's doing the work of judgment by incarnation. All those who have experienced God's work of judgment in the last days can bear witness to these facts. It's so meaningful for God incarnate to do the work of judgment in the last days. I'm still not very clear at all. Since God used the prophets to convey all the words of God, well then, in the last days, God can also use man to convey his word in doing the judgment work. Am I not right about it? Many people just can't perceive why God doesn't choose to use man to do the work of judgment in the last days mainly because man's substance is corrupt with satanic disposition. Even if they are perfected and directed by the Holy Spirit, they are unworthy of expressing God's words, even less expressing God's disposition, His almightiness, and His wisdom or what God has and is. Since the man used by God is humanity in substance with no divinity, he isn't qualified to work in God's identity. Whatever he says or does can't represent God, so he can't do the work of saving mankind. For example, God used Moses to do the work of the age of law. Moses himself could convey God's words just like one of the prophets does. So why did he not dare to speak in God's stead then? Because he was a man, and he wasn't God incarnate. That is the substantial difference between God incarnate and the man used by God. Some of you asked, since God used Moses in the age of law, why doesn't God then use man to do the work of judgment once again here in the last days? There's a special background for God to use Moses to do the work of the age of law. People in the age of law were shallowly corrupted, and the work of the age of law was not to transform man's disposition, 
but to issue commandments, statutes, and ordinances to lead mankind's life. God used Moses mainly to issue commandments, statutes, and ordinances to tell man how to obey Jehovah's laws and commandments and the principles necessary for man's life and let man know how to live before God and how to worship God, thus leading the newborn mankind to live on earth. Therefore, we could know his work could be fulfilled by using Moses. Obviously, whether God does his work by incarnation or by using man in any given age is according to the management plan of God and the need of corrupt mankind. The redemptive work in the age of grace and the judgment work in the last days are the work of opening an age and of ending one, and they are the work of redeeming and saving mankind. But this absolutely must be done by God incarnate and can't be done by anyone instead. Almighty God's word is so very clear. The end time work is for God to express the truth in his righteous disposition so as to judge man, purify, and save man. This kind of work can only be done by God incarnate. Man is not God incarnate or truth. He can't do God's work of judgment in the last days. It makes so much sense. Yes, it does. Now I understand God's work can only be done by God and God himself, and not by just anyone. I have a question. I've read God's words and the Lord Jesus' words in the Bible. And recently I've read some of Almighty God's words as well. They are indeed the truth and have authority and power. But what I want to ask is, some spiritual figure's words conform to the truth and are also beneficial to man. Can you tell me the difference between these figure's words that are compatible with the truth and God's word that's of the truth? Please fellowship on that. That is a good question. And it's just what I want to ask. I will listen well. But the spiritual figure's words that line up with the truth are also the truth, right? Could there be any substantial difference? Are you oversensitive to it? You make such a simple question so complicated. You've asked such a crucial question, Pastor Kim. Many people just cannot quite grasp the key to investigating the true way. They admit that Almighty God's word is the truth, and that it has authority, and that it has power. But as they fail to tell the difference between spiritual figures' words, which are compatible with the truth and the truth as it is expressed by God, it's very hard for them to accept God's work and then be raptured before God's throne. If people regard all those words in line with the truth as God's word, they're so easily deceived to follow and worship man and follow Satan, leading to the result of resisting God, betraying God, and offending God's disposition. Just like many people adore religious pastors and leaders and follow false Christs, it's cursed by God. So believers must be able to discern what's the truth, what's knowledge and doctrine, and what's the difference between the truth and the words in line with the truth. This is exceedingly important. One who doesn't know the truth doesn't know Christ. One who fails to discern the substantial difference between the truth and the words compatible with the truth can't possibly hear God's voice and return to God, which is absolute. So then, what is it that is the truth? And what is the word in line with the truth? Let's take a look at the words of Almighty God. Please turn to page 826. The truth is the most real of life's aphorisms, and the highest of such aphorisms among all mankind, because it is the requirement that God makes of man, and is the work personally done by God. Thus, it is called life's aphorism. It is not an aphorism summed up from some thing, nor is it a famous quote from a great figure, Instead, it is the utterance to mankind from the master of the heavens and earth and all things, and not some words summed up by man, but the inherent life of God. 
And so it is called the highest of all life's aphorisms. You must understand what is the scope of the truth and what is beyond the scope of the truth. If a person receives some insights and knowledge through his experience from the words of truth, do you think these are the truth? At most, we can say he has a little knowledge of the truth. The words man receives through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit do not represent the words of God or the truth, and these are not the truth. We can only say he has some knowledge of the truth and receives some enlightenment from the Holy Spirit. Everyone experiences the truth, but their circumstances differ, and what they gain from the same truth differs. And yet all their knowledge combined cannot fully clarify this one truth. This is how profound the truth is. Why do I say that which you gain and your knowledge cannot replace the truth? If you share your knowledge with others, they would experience it in a few days of pondering. However, man cannot fully experience the truth in an entire lifetime. Even all the people of the world working together cannot fully experience it. You can see how profound the truth is. The truth cannot be fully articulated with words. When put in man's language, it is man's aphorism. Mankind can never fully experience the truth and should live in accordance with it. One truth can sustain the existence of the whole of mankind for thousands of years. The truth is the life of God Himself. It represents the disposition of God Himself, the substance of God Himself, and all that within Him. You might say, you have the truth after some experience of it. But can you represent the disposition of God? You cannot. You may have some experience or light in some aspect or part of a truth, but you cannot supply it to sustain one person for eternity. So that light of yours is not the truth. It is just what man can achieve. It is the experience man should have, the experience and knowledge due to him. A real part of the experience of the truth. Such light, enlightenment, and knowledge based on experience can never replace the truth. Even if all mankind has experienced the same truth, all their knowledge cannot substitute for that one truth. Man's life is forever man's life. No matter how close your knowledge to the truth, to the meaning of God, or to the requirements of God, it can never replace the truth. Yeah. Speaking of what is truth, and what is the word in accordance with the truth, Almighty God has made it quite clear. This is it. The truth comes from God, and all that is expressed by Him, that is the truth. All of this is completely beyond doubt. So, then what exactly is the truth? What is the substance of the truth? The truth is all God's expression. It's naturally the expression of the substance of God's life, what God has and is, and God's disposition. The truth is the reality of all positive things. It never changes and will exist forever. The truth is God's life being with authority and power. So it can purify man, save man, and perfect man, and can be man's eternal life. God expresses the truth so that man can accept the truth as life and live by God's word. If man gains the truth as life, then his corrupt and satanic disposition will be absolutely cleansed. As long as man lives by the truth, then he can live out the likeness of a real man and become the one that is holy and become the one that is after God's heart. God then is able to fulfill the meaning of his creation of mankind. This can be said to be the ultimate result that God's work of salvation is hoping that it will attain. After the great tribulation, the ones left alive are those who obey and worship God. 
those who gain the truth and are saved. Such mankind will be brought into God's kingdom, enjoy the promises of God, and receive the wonderful destination. This is the fact God's words will fulfill and the fruits of the truth expressed by God. Although the words of those great spiritual figures conform to the truth and edify others, they are not the truth and can't be equated with God's word. You see, God's word can be man's life, while man's word simply cannot be man's life. Indeed, the truth can purify man, change man, and can perfect man. But man's words that are in accordance with the truth can't purify and change and just cannot perfect man. And this, as you know, is an undeniable fact. As we can see, a great many people have been used by God throughout the ages. But among all of them, no matter how long they worked and how much they said, no one is able to, at all, purify or save or perfect man. And why is this so? It's because man's words that accord with the truth are their limited understanding after they experience the truth of God's words. What they express are only their opinions and views and represent their own stature and understanding of God and the truth. Even if their pure understanding is in line with the truth, beneficial and helpful to man, they can only be considered as right words in accordance with the truth. The words in accordance with the truth fall far short of the substance of the truth and cannot be called truths. Men's writings and sermons are out of their burden to the churches. Their purpose is to shepherd, console, and exhort believers to help others resolve some difficulties and puzzles in belief in God. But their words can only sustain people for a period of time, a stage, and can by no means replace the effect brought by God's work. The fact is enough to prove that man's words, in accordance with the truth, fall far short of the substance of the truth. So we can't say that they are truths, much less the words of God. This is the main difference between the truth and man's word that accords with it. Now, is that clear? Yes. 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 Your fellowship is so great. The words of Almighty God have stated it very clearly. Having believed in the Lord for years, I've never heard of anyone who can differentiate between the words of God and the words of great spiritual men as clearly as this. We've gained a lot from this fellowship. We used to adore great spiritual men and look up to men who worked for years and interpreted scriptures and preached well. We blindly treated their words as the truth. We were so lacking in discernment. Without truth, we are too easily deceived. Yes. One thing we can certainly say is that no man can ever express the truth. Pastor Zhang, all the theological theories we have learned are not truths either. Right. Based on today's fellowship, they are knowledge and doctrine summarized by man rather than the truth. That's right. Now we understand. Only the word of God is the truth, and man's word is not the truth. Ah, I really feel your fellowship today reverses our deviations in the way we believe in God. Pastor Kim, I hope our fellowship has successfully answered the questions you had. Ah, uh, your fellowship is practical. Now I can see that only the word of God is the truth. Although the words of the spiritual greats conform to the truth, they are a great distance from the substance of the truth and can't be considered truths. Truth is truth and doctrine is doctrine. They can't be mentioned in the same breath. Almighty God's words certainly did resolve our actual problems. The truth that Almighty God expresses, it is what we lack and also what we need most. I want to thank Almighty God so much. Amen. 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 Your fellowship is so enlightening. And now I understand that although the words of the spiritual greats can edify others, 
They're only words in line with the truth. They can't be said to be God's words, or said to be the truth. Many theological theories of man are little more than doctrine, and may not accord with the truth. Only the word of God is the truth, and can be man's life. This is for sure. Yet, I'm not clear about the meaning and the fruit of God's word being man's life. Could you please fellowship in detail? I feel that this question is a very profound one. <clears throat> the apostles' letters are inspired by God and are therefore God's words. And great spiritual men's words are all enlightened by the Holy Spirit, so they also can be said to come from God. In my view, they are all words of truth. We shouldn't have doubt. If it conforms to truth, it's truth. And only the words that don't are not truths. All of the words that conform to the truth can be man's life. And those that do not conform with the truth cannot be man's life. Is there anything wrong with my understanding? Pastor Lee, that is not correct. Just now, brothers and sisters from the Church of Almighty God fellowship very clearly. Why can't you discern between the truth and the words that are in accordance with the truth? God's word is supreme, and it has God's authority and his power. Man's words, no matter how close to the truth, can't be put on a par with the word of God. Mm. Mm. All right. If the words of spiritual great men were truths then why had they not gained the truth and life? Why had they not been approved by God after believing in him many years? These great men's words could not even change themselves. So how could they change others? This is an excellent debate. The more we do so, the clearer we understand the truth. It is true that only the words of God can be man's life and can change and can perfect man. The word of man, no matter how close it may be to the truth, is not truth and can't change or perfect man. This is an absolutely undeniable fact. And even though man acknowledges that only the words of God can be their life, very few of them can see clearly the meaning and the fruit of the word of God being man's life. If they can see clearly that this is the case, they will thirst for and pursue the truth. What the truth actually is, is understood by few people. Nor are there those who know why the truth can be man's life, or those who understand what the result of the truth actually being the life of a man means to them, or in fact, to man. To grasp this aspect of the truth, we should first know that man was created by God, and the life of man comes from God. And the fact is, there is nothing but God that can give the real life to man. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. God has created mankind in accordance with His image. So God will definitely bestow new life to man. And when God redeems and saves man in his two incarnations, both of them say, I am the truth, the way, and the life. God comes and brings the way of everlasting life. It's beyond doubt that God is to bestow the eternal life to man so that man can gain eternal life. So then we can see that the way of everlasting life is all the truth. God expresses to purify and perfect man. The Lord Jesus once said, Truly, truly, I say to you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe you this? The Lord Jesus has expressed it very plainly. And his message is the truth. God's way is the eternal life that he is willing to bestow upon man. If man follows God's way, he'll never see death. And if man can follow the way of God, he will gain eternal life. Let us all listen to the words of Almighty God. Excuse me, can we read this book? I me too. Have one too. Oh, me too. Oh, yes, me too. Thank you. 
Thank you. Turn to page 57. Almighty God says, Christ of the last days brings life and brings the enduring and everlasting way of truth. This truth is the path through which man shall gain life and the only path by which man shall know God and be approved by God. If you do not seek the way of life provided by Christ of the last days, then you shall never gain the approval of Jesus and shall never be qualified to enter the gate of the kingdom of heaven, for you are both a puppet and prisoner of history. Those who wish to gain life without relying on the truth spoken by Christ are the most ridiculous people on earth. And those who do not accept the way of life brought by Christ are lost in fantasy. And so I say that the people who do not accept Christ of the last days shall forever be despised by God. Christ is man's gateway to the kingdom during the last days, which none may bypass. None may be perfected by God except through Christ. The words of Almighty God have stated it very clearly. The way of truth brought by Christ of the last days is indeed the way of everlasting life. And this way of everlasting life is the glorious eternal life God bestows upon man. If man gains the life bestowed upon him by God, then he can receive the eternal life and he will not die. Then why is it that the fact is the word of God alone can be man's eternal life? Let's all take a look at what Almighty God says about it. Turn to page 53. Almighty God says, The way of life is not something that can be possessed by just anyone, nor is it easily obtainable by all. That is, because life can only come from God, which is to say, only God himself possesses the substance of life. There is no way of life without God himself. And so only God is the source of life and the ever-flowing wellspring of living water of life. From when he created the world, God has done much work involving the vitality of life, has done much work that brings life to man, and has paid a great price so that man might gain life. For God himself is eternal life, and God himself is the way by which man is resurrected. Man's life originates from God. The existence of the heaven is because of God, and the existence of the earth stems from the power of God's life. No object possessed of vitality can transcend the sovereignty of God. And no thing with vigor can break away from the ambit of God's authority. Only God possesses the way of life. Since his life is immutable, so it is eternal. Since only God is the way of life, so God himself is the way of eternal life. Let me read one passage. God himself is life and the truth and his life and truth coexist. Those who are incapable of gaining the truth shall never gain life. Without the guidance, support, and provision of the truth, you shall only gain letters, doctrines, and moreover, death. God's life is ever-present, and his truth and life coexist. If you cannot find the source of truth, then you will not gain the nourishment of life. If you cannot gain the provision of life, then you will surely have no truth. And so, apart from imaginations and conceptions, the entirety of your body shall be nothing but flesh, your stinking flesh. Know that the words of books do not count as life. The records of history cannot be feted as the truth, 
and the doctrines of the past cannot serve as an account of words presently spoken by God. Only that which is expressed by God when he comes to earth and lives among man is the truth, life, God's will, and his actual manner of working. Let's stop it here. Why can God's word be man's life? Almighty God's words have stated it clearly. God is the source of the life of all things. God can not only create the heavens and earth and all things, but he can also rule everything, which is widely known. The fact is that God is who he is, and it can only be God who is eternal life. So God can rule the fate of all things forever. Except God, no person, matter, or thing is eternal, and nothing can last forever. God created the heavens and earth and all things with the Word. God's Word will exist forever. Just like the Lord Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So the truth God expresses will exist forever and never change. This is eternal life. God's Word itself is the eternal way of life and can be man's eternal life. All the words expressed by God incarnate are the expressions of God's life, God's righteous disposition, and what God has and is, representing His almightiness and wisdom. They are the Creator's will and requirements toward man. These are all the truth that corrupt man must possess in order to be saved and are the eternal way of life God gives to man. All of those who have truly experienced God's words, have witnessed this wonderful fact. The more we experience the words of God, the more we feel that God's words are the truth and life, and that God's words are inexhaustible. Yes, every word of God is sufficient for us to experience through the course of a lifetime. When we experience God's words to a certain extent, we are certain to gain truth and life from the Word. When we live by God's words, we will feel enriched, peaceful, joyful, comforted, and hopeful. And deep down in our heart, we are certain to feel the presence of God as well as the strength that is given by the words of God. Besides, God's words become our faith and life. The fact is enough to prove, you see, that the words of God are indeed the immutable truth. Then we see only God's words can be man's eternal life, which is absolutely true, without question. All the truth God expresses when doing the work of judgment in the last days is the life that God bestows upon mankind. Every single item of the truth can be a part of man's life, for example, the truth of being an honest person can make man live out normal humanity and the likeness of a real man. Knowledge about God can make man fear God, obey God, worship God, and be blessed by God to a thousand generations. Relying on and obeying God helps man in receiving God's blessings and guidance. If someone truly loves God, they will be greatly used by God, and then they will be God's servants forever. If one walks in God's way, and he fears God and also shuns evil, then he will achieve God's promise to enter the kingdom of heaven. From these we're sure to see that if man receives these truths, then they shall gain the eternal life and enjoy the eternal blessings as well. Every single item of the truth can be man's life and can bring man God's blessings as well. This is the true meaning of the truth, being man's life. Praise God! Uh, yes. That's right. yes. That's right. yes. yes. Such an answer is very clear. The words of Almighty God are truly the truth. The words can be man's life. Now we understand why only God's words can be man's life. It's because only God's words are the truth and nothing except for the truth can be man's life. This is an absolutely undeniable fact. Then, what is the effect of the words of God being man's life? 
Let's read Almighty God's words. Please turn to page 320. I'll read it. Almighty God says, Though the word is simple and ordinary, the word from the mouth of God become flesh, shakes the heavens and earth. His word transforms the heart of man, the notions and the old disposition of man, and the old appearance of the entire world. Through the ages, only the God of this day works in such a manner, and only he speaks and saves man thus. Thereafter, man lives under the guidance of the word, shepherded and supplied by the word. They live in the world of the word, live within the curses and blessings of God's word, and even more live under the judgment and chastisement of the word. These words and this work are all for the sake of man's salvation, achieving God's will, and changing the original appearance of the world of old creation. God created the world with the word, leads men throughout the universe with the word, conquers and saves them with the word. Finally, he shall use the word to bring the entire world of old to an end. Only then is the management plan wholly complete. Only if one knows God and has the truth does he live in the light. And only when his view of the world and his view of life change does he change fundamentally. Only when he has his goal in life and conducts himself according to the truth, only when he obeys God absolutely and lives by God's word, only when he feels assured and enlightened deep in his soul, only when his heart is free of darkness, and only when he lives freely and unrestrained in God's presence, only then does he live a true human life and have the truth. Besides, the truths you have are from God's word and from God himself. The ruler of the entire universe and all things, God Most High, approves of you as a real man living the true human life, what could be more meaningful than God's approval? Such is a person who has the truth. The word of Almighty God has made it clear, the result of God's word being the actual life of man. So then, after we accept God's work in the last days, we see all the words Almighty God has expressed are absolute truths. God's disposition, and also what God has and is. The words of Almighty God have revealed all mysteries of God's management plan. The inside truth of the three stages of God's work of saving man, the mystery of the incarnation, the significance of God's name, the inner truth of the Bible, how Satan corrupts mankind, how God saves mankind, the destination and end of each kind of man, how man should pursue so that they can be saved and perfected and so on. They opened our eyes and we enjoyed all of these. Almighty God's words like a double-edged sword thoroughly disclose our satanic nature and various follies of disobedience and resistance to God we realized we've truly been corrupted by Satan deeply and felt ashamed and humiliated for having no human likeness at all. God's words have completely conquered us. It does show that God's words are the truth and are able to conquer mankind. So, we experienced the judgment of Almighty God's words as if we were face to face with Him. We came to know God's righteous disposition and practically experienced God's majesty, his wrath and intolerance of man's offense, and thus we came to fear God in our heart. This is the result of purifying and perfecting man by the words of God. The judgment of Almighty God's words has made our outlook on life and values change in varying degrees in the past, we sought worldly wealth, fame, honor, and position. But now, 
we focus on pursuing the truth and being honest persons, pursuing to know God and obey God and love God, and to perform the duty of a created being to satisfy God. Gradually, our life disposition has been transformed and we have the likeness of a real man. Such life is of great value and significance. Experiencing God's work in the last days, we can see all of the words of Almighty God can indeed purify and they can save and they can perfect man as well. And they can be man's life. And they, the words of Almighty God, can bring man the true human life. This is the result of the work of God through the expression of His words, which proves only God's words, which are the truth, can purify man and save man and perfect man. And only the words of God can be truly man's life. If man truly gains the truth from God's words, he will know God, obey God, and love God, and will be compatible with God and never betray God. Such man will gain the eternal life and will never die. This is the effect of the truth of God's words being man's life. Your fellowship is indeed quite practical. Only God's words are really the truth, which can purify and change, and save man too, so that man can be holy, living the true human life. Truly, only the words of God can be man's life. Yes, I agree. In the past, we didn't know that only God's word can be the pathway to eternal life to man. So we believed in God muddle-headedly. And what we did not do is to pursue the truth. That's really the biggest mistake. It appears that we in fact cannot gain life without pursuing the truth. Failing to gain life, how could we gain his approval? Now I understand. Gaining the truth as well as gaining the life is the true belief in God. Well said, so true. So true. The words of the preachers of the Church of Almighty God have left me feeling brightened. It is not an easy thing for anyone to believe in God. Gaining the truth as life is just very meaningful. We know now that this is the true human life. It is because men don't have God's word as their life that they are sinking deeper and deeper into a cycle of corruption. It's just so practical for us to be able to receive God's Word as our life. God's Word can make us cast away our satanic disposition and become sanctified. Won't we receive eternal life when we become sanctified? It seems that what Almighty God brings is really the eternal way of life. Yes. 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 From the fellowship of these truths, we see the difference between man's Word and God's Word as well as between God's work and man's work. It's just so crucial for us to recognize the Lord's voice and for us to welcome His return. All mysteries are revealed by the truth of Almighty God so that all of us can have true belief and clear understanding. Ah, I feel enlightened, as if I'm stepping into the sun. All thanks be unto Almighty God. Amen. I have one more point to ask. Since Almighty God has expressed the truth in order to judge and in order to purify man, then how do you experience God's judgment and purification? Could you share your testimonies? Would you? Because that's what we're here to seek. We really want to hear how you have experienced Almighty God's work of judgment. Please share with us. Yes, yes. Please. Please. I want to hear too. then I'll be happy to share. Thanks be to God. I'll talk about my experience after accepting the judgment and chastisement of the words of Almighty God. (laughs) 
I believed in the Lord for more than 30 years. I served and I spent for the Lord, which I did quite zealously, in fact. And I also suffered a lot. I went to the Philippines, South Africa, and other countries many times in order to preach the gospel of the Lord. In my view, in today's society full of material desires, a person like me who forsook everything and labored for the Lord would be the one who loves the Lord. Everything I did would gain approval of the Lord. I would absolutely be caught up into the kingdom of heaven and gain the reward when the Lord returns. After accepting Almighty God's work in the last days and reading His words, I knew that my thinking was wrong. Let me read Almighty God's words to you. You merely wish for the grace of Jesus and merely want to enjoy the blissful realm of heaven. Yet you have never obeyed the words spoken by Jesus and have never received the truth expressed by Jesus when he returns to flesh. Your loyalty is in word only. Your knowledge is merely intellectual and conceptual. Your labors are for the sake of gaining the blessings of heaven. And so, what must your faith be like? Your hearts are filled with desires and wealth. Your minds are filled with material things. Every day, you calculate how to gain from me. Assessing how much wealth and how many material things you have gained from me. Every day, you await ever more blessings to come down upon you, so that you may enjoy more and greater pleasurable things. What you want is not the truth or life, and not the principles by which to conduct yourself, much less my painstaking work. It is everything your flesh possesses, money, position, family, marriage, and so on. For my word or my work, you simply have no regard. So I sum up your belief in one word, perfunctory. That which you are truly devoted to, you will try to achieve at any price. But I find this is by no means the case with your belief in God. Here your devotion and your earnestness are lesser. So I say, all those who are not utterly sincere have failed at believing in God. Think carefully. Are there not many failures among you? God's words pierced my heart and my spirit just like a kind of sharp double-edged sword, making me realize that my believing in God was only for the receiving of blessings and grace from Him. My spending, sacrificing, and suffering was not out of loving the Lord, but for the blessings of the kingdom of heaven and great rewards in the future. My intentions and various means to barter with God were completely exposed in the light. How ugly and contemptible they were. Back in my years of believing in the Lord, back when I was blessed with remarkable family harmony, with rich materials, and with wonderful peace, I would thank the Lord and I would praise Him quite joyfully then. But when the Lord didn't satisfy me as I prayed to Him when faced with adversity, tribulation, and trials, I would complain to the Lord, misunderstand Him, and stray from Him. I even argued with the Lord, not willing to spend for Him. But when I thought of the blessings of the kingdom of heaven and his rewards, 
I had the faith to work for the Lord again. Now I realize I didn't truly believe in and love the Lord. Yes, I was just deceiving the Lord as well as making use of the Lord. Just as what God says, Man searches for me in the midst of pain, and he looks unto me among trials. During times of peace he enjoys me, when in peril he denies me. When he is busy, he forgets me, and when he is idle, he goes through the motions for me. Yet never has anyone loved me throughout their whole life. The disclosure that's within Almighty God's words left me just so both ashamed and humiliated. I saw that while believing in God, I didn't actually treat God as God. I didn't have real obedience and reverence for Him, but was just filled with demands. I was really just quite selfish and base and greedy and evil, which was the total nature of Satan. I was just a base person. I was bent solely on profit as well. How holy is God, also how righteous, with such pleasures of the flesh and such extravagant desires in believing in God. Even if I follow God all my life, I would never receive God's approval but be forsaken and eliminated by God. After that, I read another passage of words from Almighty God. Please turn to page 342. It is the belief in God so that you may obey God, love God, and perform the duty that should be performed by a creature of God. This is the aim of believing in God. You must achieve a knowledge of the loveliness of God, of how worthy God is of reverence, of how, in His creatures, God does the work of salvation and making them perfect. This is the minimum that you should possess in your belief in God. Belief in God is principally the switch from a life in the flesh to a life of loving God, from a life within nature to a life within the being of God. It is coming out from under the domain of Satan and living under the care and protection of God. It is being able to achieve obedience to God and not obedience to the flesh. It is allowing God to gain your entire heart, allowing God to make you perfect and freeing yourself from the corrupt satanic disposition. The word of Almighty God brought light to my heart and reversed my wrong views towards pursuit. From that point on, my belief in God began to take a turn. I lived no longer in pursuit of the grace of God or His rewards, and I had a fear of God and focused on seeking and practicing the truth always. I performed my duty according to the requirements of God, and I placed importance on eating and drinking the Word of God, pursuing to know God in His Word and to know myself in God's Word and to accept God's judgment and chastisement. Through experiencing God's judgment and chastisement, I had some knowledge of God's holy and righteous disposition that brooks no offense by man. I came to know my wrong intentions and impurities in believing in God and my notions and imaginations towards God and had true hatred towards my satanic nature of resisting and rebelling against God. I began to betray the flesh and Satan. My obedience and reverence toward God increased gradually, and my relationship with God became more and more normal. During the experience, I came to realize that God's judgment and chastisement are really God's true love to man, 
the greatest salvation to man. I cannot gain such results after many years' belief in the Lord in the age of grace. For all these are brought from the judgment of Almighty God in the last days. All of the glory be given unto Almighty God. Amen. This testimony is so practical. From it, I could see that Almighty God's words can change and judge and purify man. Now I am very sure that Almighty God is the return of the Lord Jesus. Almighty God has revealed man's wrong intentions and aim of believing in God through his word. Except the returned Lord Jesus, who else could express such words with authority and power? The word of Almighty God is truly God's voice. Clearly, Almighty God is the returned Jesus. All thanks be to Almighty God. Amen. Amen. I am so brightened. The Lord Jesus has finally returned. We all meet the Lord Jesus again. Amen. Oh, Lord, after all this time, I see your appearance. For so many years, I've been expecting the Lord's return. But I never thought the Lord Jesus would descend in China in secret and do a stage of work of judging, chastising, and purifying man. God's deeds are so wonderful and are unfathomable to man. Oh, Almighty God, when your words first came upon me, I admit that I didn't know you, and I didn't recognize your voice at all. I was truly foolish and blind, and I was ignorant and numb. But even so, you didn't abandon me. In fact, you inspired me and you allowed me to hear your voice. And you brought me be before you one step at a time. Now I have enjoyed the watering and provision of your living water, God. And this is your grace and mercy on me. I've understood your 6,000-year management plan of saving mankind and realize the way that you save mankind from the hands of Satan step by step. I see your disposition is not only mercy and loving kindness, but more, it's wrath and majesty and judgment and chastisement. And I see that your words truly are the truth and the way and the life. Oh, Almighty God, I sincerely believe you are the return of the Savior Jesus I've expected for such a long time. From now on, I'm willing to accept you as my Lord and as my God and accept the judgment and purification of your word in order that I might become Someone that reveres God, obeys God, and is compatible with God. 
Oh, almighty God, your servant has come to understand your incredible desire to save mankind. And I will bear witness to you, oh God, using my own experience. And I will try to bring those people before you who genuinely believe in you and who thirst, thirst for your appearance to repay your perfect love, amen.